25,000 years before the time of the pharaohs, deer hunters roamed the icy plains of Europe and Siberia. Though they lived so long ago, these people were very much like us. They lived together in close-knit clans and families. They experienced joy and felt sorrow, just as we do. They buried their dead and mourned the loss of loved ones, leaving gifts and ritual objects in the grave. With skill, they crafted tools, weapons, and implements from materials found in each new landscape. They wove fabric and sewed their clothing using bone needles. They built shelters and made journeys across the sea. entered the world of symbols, of painting and language. How did we come to be a species of such complexity, the people of the world? Where did we come from? Where did the human journey begin? In 1969, a team of archaeologists led by Richard Leakey began searching the barren hills of Kubifora in Kenya. They were looking for the bones of our ancestors. In an extraordinary stroke of fortune, they stumbled upon a near complete skull of a strange creature. Encased in sandstone, it was lying half exposed after recent rains. Unlike many fossils found in the field, the skull came out quite easily. That evening, they examined the skull by lamplight back at the camp. They knew they'd unearthed a major discovery. The wide, dish-shaped face and bony crest told them it was an ancient species. It was a hominid, a long extinct member of the family which includes humans and apes. Dating later proved that it was almost two million years old. It turned out to be a pivotal find, because six years later they found another skull in the same place, from the same period of prehistory. But this was quite clearly another species. For paleontologists, this had dramatic implications. The shape of the skull was completely different, more human and less ape-like. These two species of early hominid must have lived on the East African plains at the same time. This changes the old picture of our origins. The simple story of a single path from the earliest hominids to ourselves has to be wrong. We need to find a new path. The search for human origins is full of mystery. There is a maze of fossil clues, entire species of hominids that are now extinct, except for one.
we humans are now the sole survivors. To search out our path, we must go back to where it all began, Africa. For 15 million years, subterranean forces have been steadily tearing the African continent apart. The machinery that drives this rent in the Earth's crust is deep beneath the surface. These are the mighty forces that bend and shape continents. They created this giant gash in the earth, the Great Rift Valley, stretching 5,600 kilometers down the length of East Africa. Over the past 60 years, fossil hunters have explored the hills of the Rift Valley. Today, much of it is dry and barren. But the world here was very different five million years ago. It was a wild and untamed place, a primordial landscape of lakes and rivers, moist jungle and savanna. The animal kingdom ruled the earth. Like now, there were the carnivores and the herbivores, the predators and the prey. There were the big cats, only then they were even bigger. And the scavengers, like hyena, they were mega-sized too. Many of them we'd easily recognize from their close relatives who are alive today. In the forests, primates found food, shelter and protection. It was a nourishing cradle for our ancestors. They were our closest relatives. <laughs> to this day, very little separates us from the great apes. We both belong to the family known as hominids. Chimpanzees are like our cousins. We share 98% of our genes. Their behavior reminds us very much of ourselves. We started the evolutionary journey together. But something came between us. Violent contortions of the earth threw up mountain ranges along the rift valley, 
creating new habitats. On the one side, tropical jungle. On the other side, new dry plains emerged. To survive, primates had to adapt to the changing environments. Five and a half million years ago, some of these primates tried something so dramatic and new that it changed the course of history. Like a child taking its first steps, our tree-dwelling ancestors attempted that miraculous balancing act, standing upright and walking. As they made their first tentative steps onto the woodland floor and out into the open savanna, they marked the beginning of the great human journey. And some of their steps were recorded in a remarkable way. On a remote section of savanna called Laitoli in northern Tanzania, scientists have preserved an extraordinary archaeological site. First discovered by Mary Leakey in 1976, this stretch of hardened volcanic ash contains a trail of fossilized footprints. 54 perfectly preserved steps of three hominids. With incredible clarity, these prints record the passing of two males and a female across this ground three and a half million years ago. On that night long ago, a volcano erupted, showering the landscape with molten rock and a layer of fine, powdery ash. We'll never know if they were fleeing the eruption or simply passing through as the landscape burned. But we do know that the second male followed behind because he stepped in the prints of the first, smudging the imprint. Soon after, rain fell, turning the ash into a wet cement which later dried and hardened like concrete. They left behind them the world's oldest footprints, the first record of upright walking. The creatures that made them were almost certainly Australopithecines, or southern apes, part of the family of apes and humans known as hominids. And now, for the first time, what is thought to be a complete skeleton of one of their kind has been discovered in South Africa. In June 1997, an inspired piece of detective work led Dr. Ron Clark and his assistants, Stephen Motsumi and Nkwani Molefe, to investigate the depths of this limestone cave at Sterkfontein. Dr. Clark had found some foot bones in an unmarked box in the museum vault. He knew they were from an upright hominid and that they were dug out of this cave some time ago. So he asked his assistants to search for the broken piece of bone that might still be exposed somewhere down in the cave. Two days later, they found what they were looking for. It's very, very exciting. It's a complete Australopithecus skull. Nothing like it has ever been found before. This is the first ever adult ape man that is complete and what is also very exciting about it is that we have the rest of the skeleton which goes back here 
A lot of it is still under the solid rock. We have to excavate it out. But here are the lower parts of the femurs or thigh bones, uh, the tibias or shin bones, the fibula, and here we have the radius or forearm bone, the feet, I have a cast of the foot bones here. Here is the cast of the lower end of the right shin bone. The foot would fit on there. This was extremely exciting. And uh, as I progressed, I uncovered, here you can see the teeth, um, the lower jaw bone, the eye socket, the cheek bone, and here is the brain case. And right back here is the area of the neck attachment with the frame and magnum. What's also very exciting about this is the age. We've been able to date this by paleomagnetic dating to around 3.3 million years ago. The skeleton was lying more or less in the position that I'm lying now, and it seems to have fallen in by accident into a steep shaft. Maybe it was still alive and was trying to find its way out and uh, it died here and came to rest in this position. I never thought we would find a, a complete skeleton. The reason is that most of the fossils we find are very badly broken up. Uh, they seem to be uh, perhaps the remains of carnivore meals or perhaps isolated bones that got washed into the cave you would expect it to be crushed, to be highly fragmented. That's not the case. It's in almost perfect condition. It's remarkable. This discovery could finally give us a complete picture of one of these ape people. At the moment, our knowledge of Australopithecines is limited. We know they had powerful jaws, and large grinding surfaces for chewing tough fibers, nuts, and roots. Their fossilized teeth show that their diet was mostly vegetarian. Rather than hunters, they were hunted by large predators. The puncture marks in this young hominid skull perfectly match the size and shape of the fossilized fangs of a prehistoric leopard. Our best information comes from the most complete skeleton excavated so far, an Australopithecus named Lucy, the celebrated three million year old hominid found in Ethiopia. This reconstruction of Lucy shows the critical change in her body shape that was necessary for walking. Her spine is different to an ape's. Instead of a rounded curve, it's S-shaped, and the position of the pelvis has changed to support an upright posture. Without these adaptations, the back couldn't absorb the impact of feet hitting the ground. Her brain was tiny, not much larger than a chimpanzee's. She had long arms and short legs, like an ape, and was little more than a meter tall. It was her species, Australopithecus afarensis, which left the intriguing trail of footsteps at Lytoli. As scientists reviewed their efforts to protect these first signs of walking, they pondered where the human journey went from here. Yeah. The evidence remains frustratingly scattered and sparse, with no clear path leading to Homo sapiens. Rather than a steady ascent from apes to ourselves, our family tree is more like a tangled bush. At one time, there were at least six different species of hominid, all sharing the African landscape. Some were Australopithecines, who were more ape than human. 
Others belonged to a group we call Homo, who were more human than ape. Out of this tangle, there eventually appeared a new character, someone we can finally see as ancestral to our species, Homo ergaster, working man. Two million years ago, this new species emerged here on the lakeside plains of East Africa. Known as the Turkana boy, this is the most complete Agasta skeleton ever found. Compared to the Australopithecines around him, Turkana boy has a radically different body design and structure. The brow ridges, those bony projections above the eyes, are thinner, and the jaw is smaller than any of Takana's contemporaries. Aged about 12, he stood 1.6 meters tall. Fully grown, he would have been stronger than anyone alive today. As soon as the bones came out of the ground, the excavators knew they had a major find on their hands. When we were in the field, excavating these bones, when we brought out this femur, the thigh bone, we realized that this boy was very large, very tall, because even with the growth still to go on the growth plates, he would grow longer in the leg. This is a big bone. So if I compare it with my own leg, for instance, and put it down and compare it with my own thigh bone, and I'm over six feet tall, that shows you how big this kid was at the age of 12. From the shape of the Takana boy's pelvis and backbone, we know that his species was highly mobile. And from the size of the brain cavity, we know that he was smart. When these tall, slender people with their keener intelligence set foot on the African landscape, they took advantage of the world around them. Nothing like Homo ergaster had ever been seen before. In body shape and behavior, they were a pioneering species. With them, we see the beginnings of a human-like lifestyle. first to have a home base like this. A place where they kept a cache of tools which they used to butcher meat and smash bones. From fragments of bones and stones found together, we know they systematically scavenged animal carcasses and brought them back to a central site. Here they removed the meat and cracked open the bones to dig out the nutritious marrow inside. This was a revolutionary development. No one else had ever lived like this. They were innovators in many different ways. Agasta was called working man for good reason. For 200,000 years, they wielded crude stone implements, heavy duty scrapers and choppers. 
But then, in a flash of brilliance, they created an entirely new design, called a Shirleyan, that would dominate tool manufacture for over a million years. The Acherlian style, specialized in large hand axes and cleavers, stone flakes fashioned on both sides to create sharp-edged knives. These tools went hand in hand with a very different life on the African plains. Agasta was the first regular meat eater. The evidence for this comes from their radically different body shape. The Takana boy has a lean, athletic figure with long, thin legs, a narrow waist, and a barrel-shaped chest. Whereas the fruit and vegetable-eating Australopithecines, like Lucy, were tubby and pot-bellied. Their shape was more ape-like, broad in the middle and tapering upwards. For Agasta, the change in diet was a smart move. If you grow a big brain, you have to give up growing and maintaining another part of the body. Uh, and that other part of the body has to be an expensive tissue, like the brain, that takes a lot of oxygen, takes a lot of energy. And the only tissue that's large enough to do that would be the gut. So if you get a big brain, you have to reduce your gut. And one way of reducing a gut is to change your diet from that of a, of a herbivorous animal to that of a carnivorous animal. Only carnivores can afford to have a shorter, smaller intestine because meat can be broken down and digested more quickly than plant matter. The energy saved by having a much smaller gut freed up exactly the right amount needed to power their bigger brain. Meat gave Homo ergaster mobility and flexibility. No longer dependent on seasonally available fruit and vegetables like the Australopithecines, Homo ergaster was free to follow the game. They began the very first journey out of Africa. Two million years ago, Homo ergaster moved north up the Great Rift Valley and literally went where no one had ever been before. They pushed out across the old world through the Middle East, they journeyed west into Europe, east into China, and southeast into Asia. By now, Ergaster had developed into a new species, Homo erectus. For years, some scientists believed that erectus evolved in each of these isolated locations into Homo sapiens and over two million years, they gradually assumed the regionally different appearance, skin, and hair coloring of modern humans. But then the science of genetics challenged this view. When scientists examined the genes of all these people, they found they were remarkably similar. How could members of the same species, separated by vast distances, have evolved over millions of years and still be genetically almost identical. It didn't add up. There had to be another source for the genes that all Homo sapiens share. One place where we all started our journey together. The Khoisan are hunters and gatherers, skilled survivors in the rugged hinterland of southern Africa. Yeah. 
living largely off game, honey, and the roots and fruits of plants. They live a semi-nomadic lifestyle, governed by the seasons and the movement of wild animals. Archaeologists believe they've been here for at least 20,000 years. But new genetic evidence says they've lived here far longer. The genetic makeup of the Khoisan contains signs of great antiquity. It turns out the Khoisan are closely connected to an ancient gene pool. Like all living creatures, we humans inherit a mixture of genes from our parents and pass them on to our children. Our genes connect us, through countless generations, to our original ancestors. Of all the people alive today, the Khoisan have the most concentrated mix of ancient human genes in the world. This leads us to a startling conclusion. Africa must have been where the ancestral tribe of humans began their journey. And each one of us can trace our ancestry to that single tribe. We are all much closer to each other than we imagined. Strip away the superficial variations in skin color, hair type and physique, and we are in fact very closely related. The genetic evidence also tells us the human journey started in Africa between two and three hundred thousand years ago. It suggests there were at least two great migrations out of Africa. The first took place two million years ago with Homo ergaster. We followed in a second wave much later around 130,000 years ago, when a new species, Homo sapiens, left the African homeland. If that's what the genetic evidence says, surely there must be fossil evidence to back it up. Instead, we're confronted with monstrous creatures who roamed the plains between the time of Homo ergaster and the arrival of Homo sapiens, Bodo and Kabwe. With massive brow ridges and gaping eye sockets, these hominids don't feel close to us at all. There are some skulls from this period, like the Zutia man, that seem to be heading in the right direction. We can see foreheads becoming higher, and with the Jebel Earhood skull, the brow ridges are smaller and the brain cavity is slowly changing shape. But so far, we haven't found the crucial fossil connection that links us to our most likely African ancestor, Homo ergaster. Around 200,000 years ago, the Great Ice Age tightened its grip on Earth. Expanding glaciers and ice caps locked up much of the world's moisture. The cold winds of change blew over Africa. Rivers dried up, lakes withered away, food stocks crashed. Thirty percent of the global land mass was covered in ice. Deserts expanded, slamming the gates shut between Africa and the Middle East for 50,000 years. Emerging humans were trapped in isolated pockets inside Africa. All other species disappeared. By now, Ergaster and the Australopithecines were gone. But the pressures of isolation worked to our advantage. They forced evolutionary change, and a new species was born.
From the Klazi's river mouth at the southern tip of Africa, you gaze out over the deep ocean swells of the great southern ocean towards Antarctica. Here we find the first clear fossil evidence for our emergence as a species. Early modern human people lived along this shoreline 120,000 years ago. Their remains, the oldest we have in the world, lie in this cave. Over the past 15 years, Professor Hilary Deacon has built up an intimate picture of how these people lived. Out of this lowest layer here, uh, we've had the uh, maxillas, the upper uh, jawbone of two individuals. One appears to have been a young male and another one an elderly female. And this is the human frontal. And uh, you can see the orbit here. This is the eye socket uh, here. And this is part of the nasal bone. And if you look at this, you orientate it the correct way then this is rather a bulbous forehead. We have a very bulbous forehead and there's no heavy brow ridge on the specimen. And that's one of the attributes which one would expect with anatomically modern humans. The other sort of remains we've got are mainly uh, jaw bones. The teeth are the hardest part of the human skeleton. So they preserve the best and that's, that's important from our point of view. And and one of the features which this has is a prominent chin. And the chin is a uh, prominent chin is an anatomically modern human feature. Early modern humans in southern Africa, like the Tyan Plas man, were hunter-gatherers. They ranged across the coastal hills and along the seashore hunting marine animals like penguin and seal and collecting shellfish. Their temporary camp at Klazi's was probably behind a sheltering dune in front of the cave. In the sediments laid down over 50,000 years, we find the remains of their fireside feasting. These people ate well the layers of rock are littered with leftovers from their meals, shells and animal bones, as well as their cooking fires. I would interpret this as evidence for the behavior of the people living here. And perhaps I can make the case for these people behaving very much in the way we would behave if we were living in a cave. Here, for example, you can see an ash layer. This is that, it, it's rather reddened, an iron stand, this would be a domestic hearth. And when we excavate these hearths, they tend to be about 18 inches or 300 millimeters in diameter, and they tend to be circular, a bit like the hot plate on your mother's stove at home. One more piece of evidence in the sediments gives us a clear sign that these people were thinking and feeling as we do. This is a piece of red ochre in the deposits. Red ochre is a natural colouring material and bringing in a colouring material like this suggests that these people had a life which was structured by the use of symbols and that's an attribute of all modern people everywhere. Here in southern Africa, we finally come face to face with the recognizable features that define our species. A modern looking anatomy, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle that supported a family structure, well-organized campsites, and a people who used red ochre for decoration to embellish their lives. The Khoisan can already trace their history back tens of thousands of years. 
It's not far-fetched to imagine their line may go back even further. With them, we may well be seeing the descendants of the Klazi's river mouth people. All this says strongly that here we are indeed looking at the birthplace of Homo sapiens. That Africa was where the evolution of a new species and a new consciousness took place. Along the coast from Klazi's, there are footprints from the same time. Someone very like us certainly passed this way. In a silent echo of their ancient predecessors at Laetoli, they left a trail of footprints. Only these were cast in sand, not ash, preserved as fossil imprints. Perhaps the Klazi's people traveled this way carrying their new genetic potential with them. As they wandered northwards, they must have passed by Lake Turkana in Kenya, because there they left traces of their genes. Fishing the salty waters today are the Turkana people. They are part of an ancient tribe whose territory once encompassed a vast area extending north into Ethiopia. The genes of the Takana people show they're closely connected to the original source group of Homo sapiens who migrated out of Africa. From here, a single event finally launched our ancestors on their epic journey. After a 50,000 year reign, the ice caps lost their grip on the earth. Around 130,000 years ago, a warmer, moister climate turned the impassable deserts of North Africa to open grass and woodlands. The gate which had trapped Homo sapiens in Africa opened wide. Grazing animals migrated, following the rich new pastures. Our ancestors, modern humans, followed them. Using their well-developed hunting and social skills, they moved slowly northwards. Our journey out of Africa had begun. It brought them to the Omo River in Ethiopia. Here, a vital clue confirms that this was one path taken by Homo sapiens, following the Great Rift Valley up into the Nile Basin. This man from Omo Kibish has the distinctive features of a modern human. The date of 130,000 years places him here at the right time to be one of our ancestors on their way north. Named the Pathfinder, he and his people journeyed up the Nile Valley on their way out of Africa. Tracing our evolutionary path to this point has not been easy. Our link to the early hominids like Lucy and Australopithecus is hazy. It's only with the emergence of Homo ergaster, who was so much more like us, that we can clearly recognize an ancestor. But the path from ergaster to ourselves petered out. For millennia, strange creatures emerged and disappeared, offshoot species that failed to find a niche. Then at last, in the caves of Klazi's River in South Africa, we found our own kind, Homo sapiens, modern humans. By now, all other upright hominid species in Africa had died out. We were the sole survivors.
But when the Pathfinder people left Africa to travel up into modern-day Israel, they were heading for an astonishing encounter. In the Middle East, 100,000 years ago, our ancestors discovered that they were not alone. They found another species, like us, but hauntingly different. They must have traveled a completely different evolutionary path to this meeting outside Africa. This encounter takes us into a new chapter in our journey, up into the frozen wastes of Ice Age Europe in search of these mystery people, the Neanderthals. In an hour, investigate the remains of animal mummies here on Discovery. Over the coming weeks, a new series, Lost Treasures of the Ancient World, explores Jerusalem and ancient Greece. And to start now, Carthage.